the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast, which goes online the last Friday of every month. And we are delighted to have with us today, Dr. Kristen Page, who is the Ruth Craft Strohshine Distinguished Chair and Professor of Biology at Wheaton College. And she gave a series of lectures at the Wade Center that we arranged to have published by InterVarsity Academic. And the result is a fantastic book called The Wonders of Creation, Learning Stewardship from Narnia and Middle Earth. So we're going to talk with Kristen about this book, and we'll just go in chronological order because your very first lecture, so there are three lectures, and the first is called Stepping Out of the Wardrobe. And I thought that was an excellent way for you to start because you begin with comments about your own childhood as to how you stepped into a place that filled you with um, a sense of wonder. So why don't you talk about that? At even age two, I, I don't think I can remember anything from age two. Why don't you share with us what developed your interest in the environment? Well, I think I was created to love to be outdoors mm. and in nature. And I also have a family that nurtures that. And so the story about the two-year-old Kristen, I don't remember it. Oh. <laughs> but there is this story in my family folklore. Um, my parents love to record our voices because um. my mom's a musician and she wanted to hear our voices at different ages. And so my dad would interview us. And there's a famous interview with two-year-old Kristen <laughs> where she was asked a series of questions about Jesus. The first was, who is Jesus? And I proclaim, he's God's son. And where is Jesus? And I said, well, he's in heaven. And then they asked me, where was heaven? And I said, well, it's in the woods. <laughs> and so I knew even at two, that was heaven to me, mm. being out in creation. And, and my mom loves birding. And my grandma was a gardener and loved to be outdoors. So I can remember picking peas with her. And um, so we were, I was surrounded in learning about nature, even though we weren't campers or hikers or that type of family. We were always in the backyard, always down in the creek um, behind mm, the house, mm. um, at my grandma's house, always in her garden. And um, so that's, that's my childhood. I think when kids are exposed at a really young age, um, it just becomes part of who you are. You realize mm. you're part of creation, I think. And I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate my family for giving me that gift. Mm. It's interesting that Lewis and Tolkien both grew up in environments where they were close to nature. Uh, yeah. Lewis's mother moved to Serhole, which is developed now, but it was a rural village like the Shire when he was no, a little you, boy. That was Tolkien's mother. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, Tolkien I meant. But also Lewis uh, grew up in Strandtown, very close to nature, both the front of the house and the back of the house. They could look, look on mountains. Uh, so you think that was kind of built into their early childhood experience mm. as well. Well, that becomes an exhortation to parents to really give their children a sense of the power of nature. Uh, I, I know I was filled with it. I understand Lewis, anytime he talks about that longing when he's in nature and this sense that you want to be somehow integrated into it and that that longing points to something that we will have in the future, which is heaven. Mm -hmm. So here at age two, you were already grasping something that Lewis was, um, that led Lewis to commit his life to Christ, this sense of the beauty of nature. And there's got to be a creator who is responsible for this beauty. And in his books, Lewis, um, portrays heaven as being out in nature in the great divorce mm. they don't go to a city like the uh, 12 gated city oh, of yeah. revelation they go out into the foothills in the mountains and the mm. same with the last battle when you go to the new narnia yeah it's out in the open it's untouched not a city. wilderness right yeah. Mm. right yeah one of the things you said Kristen, was when tolkien talked uh, developed his 
new world and many people talk about his idea of sub-creation and just that phrase sub-creation, it's like he's dreaming up a whole new world, but he himself said, and you quote him, it is not a new world, but an imagining or imaginary history of our world. I really enjoyed learning about Tolkien's concept of sub-creation, um, the idea that God gives us this creative ability, and Tolkien was able to take that and use what is familiar to us to create places that are new. Mm-hmm. And the lessons in those places translate to the places that we actually live in. That, mm-hmm. That's really what I was trying to do mm-hmm. um, with this work, is say that we can spend time in sub-creation, mm-hmm. in, this, in uh-huh. Middle Earth, and bring the lessons that we learn there back to the real world because Tolkien was so good at using God's creation as a template for what he created with Middle Earth. Right. And that line that you quote about it's actually an imaginary history of ours reminds me of something you have discovered in your research about changes Tolkien made um, that reinforce that it's more... He's going back to a medieval view of our world. Uh, yes, he didn't want to uh, include things that were reminders of our world. Uh, in the entire epic, there's one metaphor where he says the fireworks went shooting by like a, a freight train or an express train. I'm kind of surprised he metaphor. left that in. I am too. I'm surprised he didn't take it out. Uh, when Lewis wrote a first draft of Till We Have Faces, he said something about going from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> And you go, the editor Greeks said, had frying pans? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he goes, uh-oh, I better get rid of that one. But he also um, didn't want to use tobacco because people associated that word with discovered in the new world. So he said pipeweed. And at one mm. point he talked about tomatoes and someone said, well, those came from the new world. So he switched it to turnips. Uh, he really wanted yeah. his world to stand alone and not remind us of our world. Yeah. Sort of yeah. a pre-industrial uh, world. Yeah, he said in the letter it was about turn of the century, the Shires, turn of the century England, but without trains. Uh, yeah, so that's, yeah. and he even, uh, the phases of the moon are correct. If you go to 1942, mm. you'll have a full moon and then I mean, a, a new moon and then a half moon and a full moon. In Lewis and Narnia, it's always a full moon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a different cosmos. The yeah. moon is always full. That is a great example of something that Kristen talks about in this first lecture chapter of this book, where you mention the reading of nature. Why don't you explain what you mean by that? Well, what that reminded me of is Tolkien is a really, he's a master naturalist. And he pays attention in a different way than Lewis. And they're doing different things with their understanding of nature. But Tolkien in his letters, he would write letters where he described the whole phenology of a plant blooming, right? So he would say, you know, on this date, I wow. saw the bud start to swell. And then on this date, I saw the opening of the bud. And by this date, I could see the pollen. And so he was paying very, very close attention to the world around him. And so it's not surprising that the moon phases matched Exactly, because he would have known that. That would have Mm. just been how he approached the world. Mm. And so when he writes about the terrain, when you're in his landscapes, you're experiencing a landscape the way that he would on a walk. Is this right? And and Mm. I, you know, so it's actually the way I walk and it drives people crazy because I'm always stopping and exploring and digging up things and Mm. taking pictures and And really examining things, and it takes a long time. And so many people, when they're reading Tolkien, will say, just get to the point. Uh But you're Uh exploring the path along the way with him. Right. Yeah. As opposed to Lewis, who is really, I'm not saying Tolkien wasn't about beauty, but Lewis really was about beauty. And he really cared about your experience Mm -hmm. in this, I think, in this landscape, um, where you really experience beauty the way that he experienced Mm -hmm. it or wanted to experience Mm -hmm. it. And when I read Lewis, I feel like I'm having more of a, from an airplane point of view. Like, so if you're walking along with his characters, you're really looking at it from above. You're seeing the whole landscape. You're not seeing the detail. You're seeing how Mm. this path fits in with the transitions along the journey. 
Yeah. Hmm. And um, and so it. I found a letter that where um, Lewis was warning somebody they were going on a walk and Tolkien was going to join them. <laughs> right. yeah. And he's gonna. It's gonna take so long. <laughs> it's it, true. It's, yeah, we yeah. can't walk the pace that we want to walk because he's gonna take so long. Well, it's the kind of the same way in reading their landscapes. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make you can make quick progress through parts of Lewis's landscapes because. He wants you to he, mm-hmm. the journey, yeah. and and for Tolkien, it's about like I need to find a a rabbit under the brush, and let's go on this long adventure to try to find or mm. to, yeah. Or he like describes the, the right, actual recipe for cooking right? the the coney. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. you could actually reproduce it. Oh yeah, in yeah. the Wade, we have a book of recipes inspired by Tolkien. Oh. I have that. Re- I have oh, you that have it. Have you tried many of them? <laughs> Not too many. Yet. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. <laughs> oh, perfect. So a perfect. few, but yes. Yeah. They're very meat and potato heavy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can see that sort of like Lewis and I think it's the in Prince Caspian where he's talking about the dryads and the trees and he talks about them eating dirt. And I'm like, okay, well, technically they're getting it from the carbon in the atmosphere. And, you know, so he's not really focused on natural sciences. He's just thinking like, I guess trees have roots and they eat dirt. And, you know, (laughs) so, but he's, you know, he's more focused on beauty than he is on the natural sciences. Yeah, that was the take I had when I was reading it. Yeah, interesting. And I like how you bring up in a couple of your chapters, Tom Bombadil. Why don't you talk about why you focus on him. Tom Bombadil is just this mystery, right? Like we, mm-hmm. who is he? He's mm-hmm. older than he's the oldest. He comes at he comes at just the right time. He um, helps him out of messes, but it's not so much that he's helping the fellowship. He's, he's teaching them. And, um, and I feel mm-hmm. like I'm not a Tom Bombadil scholar, but I, what struck me by the old forest and their interactions with Tom Bombadil was that they recognized that they were created. They recognized mm. that they're not just going to move through this forest for their own purposes. Mm. At, at the expense of the forest, the, the forest has some say. And, um, and I mm. think that I'm not sure that it would have, well, they would have been eaten, I guess, um, or <laughs> by the old man Willow. But, um, um, but I feel like had Tom Bombadil's character not he, telling the stories and 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 helping them reposition their image of themselves as part of creation that was mm. I, that was a really important part of their transformation mm. along the way mm. you talk in the last chapter about wonder and you I wanted to read a quote you you said about Tom Bombadil because I, I highlighted it. it says Tom Bombadil represents taking delight in things for themselves without reference to yourself watching observing and to some extent knowing. I actually think part of that's a quote from Tolkien. And understanding the rights and wrongs of power and control in such a way that the means of power become quite useless or valueless. And then you you quote from Tolkien in, in The Lord of the Rings where he talks about they all, all of a sudden felt as, as strangers where all other things were at home. Um, and so that idea of valuing creation for itself and not thinking about it as how can we exploit this, how can we use this, I thought right. that was um, mm. really... Uh, profound, and then especially how you connected that to wonder and mm. and the desire for mm. stewardship. Yeah, I Bombadil and and Goldberry are wonderful, right? They're every mm. part of that is you're you're kind of the first time. I don't know many of the listeners have read this many times by now. Mm. But if you can think back to the first time you read that, um, was it wonderful? Like, mm. was it like, wow, that's really wow? Wouldn't it be wonderful to meet someone like that on a mm. hike in the forest? Mm. But I think that when when the hobbits entered the forest, they were definitely about use. They were like, we're just mm. going to, we're going to use it as a shortcut. We're going to get through. Mm. We are going to, we're just going to manhandle these branches until we get to where we want to go. Mm. And Bombadil was instrumental in helping them understand that, no, you are part of this, but you can't just control it. It's not for your use. They were strangers. Mm. They weren't welcome there. And the the forest made that very clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, once they rewrited their understanding of themselves and of maybe even the purpose of the journey, I think Bombadil was really important Mm -hmm. for that. And I, I, the reason that that became so important in my book is that I feel like we often think about being in nature as 
just for us, right? Mm. We get. Yes. To, I, I enjoy going out for a hike. I like taking the photos, but that's still utilitarian. Mm. I'm doing it for me, mm. and I. But I'm part of creation, and I, I need to be in it. I need mm-hmm. to enjoy it, to learn about it, to know it, to want to care about it. But I really need to change my land ethics so that I understand that I don't. I shouldn't presume the power over what happens mm. there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I. I feel like um, a lot of times we get lost in what nature does for us Mm. and not how we're part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, we really, we really have to change our minds if we're going to have any effect on the future of, of a lot of the resources. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we can't use resources, but I'm just Mm -hmm. saying how we use them, why we're using them, who it affects when we use them. And even the ecosystem that it yeah. affects are really important things to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're all interdependent and God created this, this glory. We need to work to preserve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I really um, liked how you mentioned uh, Mary and Pippin. Just even these small minor hobbits were able to aid. Was it Treebeard? Treebeard? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, David, talk about your discovery about Treebeard. Uh, well, Lewis and Tolkien both liked the Norse myth. Uh, the Elder Ed is the poetic Ed is. Uh, Tolkien got a lot of his names, Gandalf and Thor and Oakenshield from the Eddas. Uh, there's another book called Heimskringla, which was by the same person who collected the Eddas, uh, Snorri Sturluson. And there's a character named Treebeard. He's a human, but he has a bushy beard. And when would that have been written? It's about 12, uh, 1200, somewhere in there. Isn't that interesting? Because wow. yeah. Treebeard, I think s- anybody who reads Lord of the Rings is just fascinated with Treebeard. Um, uh, supposedly Treebeard's uh, voice was based on Lewis's voice. He had a very uh, boom, boom oh, wow. voice. <laughs> there, there, not oh, so wow. hasty. Well, I just, uh, back on that topic of wonder, I just wanted to mention one other quote from your book. You, you sort of conclude, you said, thus we learn from him, Tom Bombadil, that we should pursue knowledge of creation, not in order to empower us to subdue creation, but rather to embolden us to wonder at our place among the marvels of creation. I thought that was a really interesting insight from your book, uh, that wonder, uh, that creation has a purpose beyond just what we can use it for. And if we recalibrate that purpose and say part of the purpose of creation is to create wonder in us, to connect us to God, for him to speak to us through creation, then that question of, well, why should we preserve xyz's animals habitat like who cares about this dumb animal um what you know we want to build a fill in the blank industrial thing here um it changes the discussion away from well who cares about that because we need uh, xyz re- natural resource um so i don't know i just thought that was a fascinating insight connecting the purpose of creation to wonder and uh, our connection to god in in a way we're almost destroying that every time we right. make one of those decisions to put uh, some utilitarian purpose above, mm-hmm. you know, the habitat of some animal. Who cares about that? Right. Well, we let, can let just... me explain, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, why Tom Bombadil isn't influenced by the ring. The ring is made to dominate. That's the whole point of the uh, ring. Yeah. And he plays with it and doesn't become invisible uh, because he doesn't have that spirit of domination. Uh, it's it, People wonder why he's not affected by the ring, but I think you just explained it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this um, word utilitarian where people think of nature as how can we use it mm-hmm. for our best interests is uh, illustrated in something you wrote in your book, this first chapter that just shocked me, how this Oxford Junior Dictionary, so it's a dictionary for children, I take it, mm-hmm. has gotten rid of the words acorn, yes. wren, Bramble, dandelion, and willow. I mean, words that they need to know. And I was especially thinking kids would want to know what a dandelion is when they hear their grandparents say, oh, get rid of those dandelions. (laughs) And I just think of the joy of dandelions as a child and making wishes and blowing. And probably all the neighbors were (laughs) aggravated. (laughs) No, no. Um, But the reason they got rid of those words is so that they could use words from digital technology. And we've talked before about the how social media, there's all these studies that it's debilitating to children. Mm. 
And our very dictionaries are reinforcing that, well, digital words are more important than words from nature. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness, that blew me away. It's very sad. I, I love many of those words. And, they're, and those just a small sample of the words that they've removed, actually. Yeah. I tried uh. to find the ones that kind of connected the most to the, the literature that I was using when I was working on, on the book. Mm. Um, but you yet, have a daughter named Ren. I do have a daughter named Ren. So and you said that if you had a son, you were going to name him. I I've thought about the name Kestrel, which oh, is a, a, oh, type wow. of, a type of um a type of falcon. Yeah. So. Mm. yeah. Let's move on to the second chapter, and this is where you really I learned so much from this book. In fact, I want to tell our listeners. Everyone, every Christian should read this book. And what you do in the second chapter is align creation care with love for your neighbor. Why don't you explain what you mean by that? Well, I think that um, I developed this concept of creation care pretty young. I, I'm of the age where when you were a kid, you didn't talk about creation care. I know that that's not true now, mm-hmm. but um, for uh, my child hears about it. Um, but When I went to college, it didn't even enter my mind that I could do something for Jesus along the lines of environmentalism because that just wasn't something that you learned at church. It wasn't really anything that I don't think it was malicious. It just wasn't in the conversation. And so I felt very confused. I felt like, well, I have to be a doctor or even though I knew that I enjoyed ecology, but made the switch to ecology pretty quickly and decided to just see where it would take me. And so in my master's program, I went to a church that had a wonderful um, college um, pastor. And he, I don't know if he did it on purpose. I suspect he did, had um, somebody come and give us a talk. And his name was Robert Parham. And he had written a book called Loving Neighbors Across Time. Mm. And it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody talk about taking care of the environment and putting it in the context of, you know, the, the most important commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. And our neighbors aren't just the people that live close to us. We all know that, but we, it's sometimes easy to forget that our, we do have neighbors in the future. Mm. And yeah. if we live to extinguish resources the way that we're living now, um, mm. we, there won't be much left for our neighbors in the future. And so that's where mm. the, mm. I've spent a lot of time thinking about, Love of creation is love of neighbor. Mm. But then I went on to do my PhD and pursue disease ecology and understanding how diseases emerge as a result of the ways that we transform landscapes made it even more important to share the idea that really taking care of creation is loving your neighbor. Because when we cut down trees, when we um, transform prairie or you can pick an you can pick an ecosystem anywhere in the world when you transform it to be a monoculture or a Mm. shopping center you've done something to the ecosystem that can perpetuate disease i don't think i have to convince anyone listening that diseases can emerge without warning right (laughs) (laughs) and you know even we don't even have to talk about a specific disease that just came to mind yeah we can talk about ebola that emerged Uh, before mm. that and there's a really strong paper that is very convincing in science that states that two years following a deforestation event you can expect an emergence of ebola wow and so we have we have within us the ability to think about how we use resources differently so that we don't impact our neighbors, mm. either through disease emergence or taking their resources away from them or mm. polluting their water or preventing them from being able to farm in healthy ways. Um, a lot of what we do is a very creation care is a justice issue. And I think that that takes people by surprise sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not just justice for creation but it's justice for our neighbors. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I had a British colleague uh, who said they're having more and more problems with flooding in England because everything is paved now. Mm. In the old days, the the rain would soak in where it fell. Mm. But if everything is concrete and asphalt, yeah. then it's got to run off somewhere and suddenly you have a f- yeah. flooding problem you hadn't thought about. I was reading uh, they had those atmospheric rivers that were coming through California and all the rain that it was oh. dropping and they were talking about you know, how much it was going to help offset the drought and everything. And, but then this one uh, ecologist or natural science guy in the interview said, 
no, we've paved most of Los Angeles and California. And so how many, he, he, you know, estimated how many millions and millions and millions of gallons of fresh water was just draining back out into the ocean. It mm. wasn't being soaked into the ground because they had just made mm. the, the ground impermeable to rain. Mm. And so he was saying we could have actually captured more of that water, but we've built our cities in a way that, you know, we mm. can't. Mm. It also changes the temperature regimes, right? Because pavement is typically oh, right. a dark substance and it, it can affect yeah, so mm. the way we construct cities needs to be more thoughtful in the future. Some mm. some places um, are using permeable um, types of pavers. Um, if you go to the Arboretum, they have um, pavers that mm. allow the water to percolate through. Yeah. Um, but, oh. And then there are some cities in the United States that do that, but infrastructure is expensive, and to replace right. it yeah. right. is a hard sell. Yeah. Right. Right. I, li- I like how in this chapter you talked about Earth Overshoot Day, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that was that was really sobering to, you know, in 1970, it was December 29th. That's the day when we Why don't used- you have Kristen explain what Yeah, Earth yeah, sorry, Overshoot- what is Earth Overshoot Day? Yeah. So Earth Overshoot Day is the day of the year where the resources that we have consumed as humanity exceed what the Earth can regenerate. And so it's essentially we're dipping into our savings account at Earth Overshoot Day. Mm-hmm. We're overspending. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Oh, that helps. That metaphor helps. Yeah. So if Earth Overshoot Day is December 31st, then we have followed our budget. We have yeah. used our resources wisely and the Earth can regenerate. But it's not, it's not December 31st. It's not close to December 31st anymore. And during mm-hmm. the COVID lockdowns, Earth Overshoot Day changed. And um, it, it actually improved, which tells me that we do have the capacity to make small uh, changes in our lives that can help Earth Overshoot Day recover. So, because right. yeah. we were driving less, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's going to we were buying big... more from Amazon, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but we were we were driving less, we were consuming less, we weren't flying as much, we weren't traveling. Yes. All of the big things that affect Earth Overshoot yeah. Day, and mm-hmm. and all of the things that I've just listed are things that privileged people do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the earth, the budget gets spent by mm-hmm. the most privileged as well. And yeah. so what was it in 1970 it Earth was, Overshoot Day? It was, was December 29th. And at this point, or at least in 2019 before the pandemic, it was July 29th. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that is sobering. And um, a point you make in your book is many times the people who suffer the consequences the most are the poor. Mm-hmm. And the whole problem that we're hearing more of about climate refugees, right. where they live on islands that are now being covered with water because of the melting of the Arctic snow ice, uh, it's things are dire. And right. And refugees are also, um, climate refugees also happen when um, climate affects agriculture right so it's not yeah. just about like losing land it's about land becoming too arid yeah or mm. or not able to or maybe even just a seasonality of a place changes enough that what they normally grow there doesn't do as well right. or pollinators yeah. are changing their timing or right so the so it's very complex and complicated and because it's complex and complicated we tend to think either we don't give enough time to think about it Because Mm. it's, it's, I think I talk a lot about like apathy. It's easy to go to apathy when things are complicated and and complex and frustrating. But we need to understand the complexity because we have to understand that we are one of these little cogs in this big wheel of complexity. Mm. And so even though we can do things that can harm, we can do things that can help as Mm. well. Mm. So one of the examples you gave in this chapter was from C.S. Lewis's Paralandra. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain that? I thought it was very helpful when uh, Ransom discovers this fruit. Right, and he he takes a taste of it, and it's delicious. It's the most delicious thing he's ever eaten. And he consumes the whole fruit, and then he goes to grab another one, and he thinks, he stops, which isn't what we normally do. And And he realizes that it won't be as delicious like I, I want to 
to save this deliciousness. So he, he, mm. the restraint there, just like, um, the Turkish delight, the opposite oh, yes. effect, right? So mm. can't stop eating the Turkish delight. Um, you get to a place where it's not even good anymore. You just want it. Right. Uh-huh. Yes. And so, but ransom was able to show that restraint that I know I fail at mm. probably most every day. Mm. Um, but it is what we want to, um, to try to achieve now, real Turkish delight is quite easy to resist. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. I'll take your word for jelly, it. Jelly uh, <laughs> covered with confectioner yeah. sugar, well, but one one bite is I plenty. Go, Didn't they have seas candy back then? <laughs> yeah, why Lewis gave that as this addictive candy? <laughs> you finish the chapter talking about, and I like this phrase. I just what's wonderful about this book is, uh, it gave me new language to think about this problem. And just starting with loving our neighbor versus what you call the orthodoxy of more. So that comes from Bill McKibben. That's his that's his phrase. And he he argues that we need to fight against this orthodoxy of more. And it's really the orthodoxy of more that is pushing the climate crisis faster than it should go. Right. And so um, the orthodoxy of more is the idea that I just want it because I want it. And if we can resist, if we can be like ransom and we can and show more restraint and really only use what we need rather than think um, we have to have more mm. to put us in a position of power or to protect us for the future. There are lots of reasons why we pursue the orthodoxy of more. I would think that some of it is actually just boredom. Mm. And so maybe we yes. can come back to wonder because mm. if we're bored, then instead of consuming more, we should go and participate more. Yeah, take mm. a walk. Yeah. <laughs> um, where is it that Lewis David talks about how boredom leads to many of the deadly sins? I, um, I don't recall such a passage. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh maybe it's um, it's Dorothy Sayers. It, it, I remembered we talked about it in one of our podcasts, and she she has an essay called "The Others." six deadly sins yeah, yeah, because yeah, so yeah, often yeah. Christians just reduce sin to just sexual sins. Mm-hmm. And she is making the point that many times, yeah, um, lust for more, right. no matter what kind of more building, tearing down things to build something new when the previous work to just find that uses up resources and That leads us then to chapter three, which you begin with another stunning um, uh, truth that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Explain what that means. Well, we're just in the midst of losing so many species from the planet. We're losing them faster than we can identify them, right? We don't. We often think that diversity is made up of all of the, as we like to say in conservation biology, the charismatic megafauna, right? Uh, The the (laughs) orangutans and the pandas and the tigers. But we're losing species that we might not even realize exist. Um, I Somebody told me, I haven't seen the paper, but somebody told me that a paper just came out about how the microbiome is an endangered species, the human microbiome. So Mm. we have organisms that live in us and on us. Yes. In fact, Erin wrote a whole essay. I have, inspired by Dr. Page's work, actually. She helped me with that essay. Oh, wow. It's published in Christian Scholars Review, right? It is. Wow. But they, I just heard this this week that um, somebody is claiming that the human microbiome should be listed as an endangered species. Interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because of all the antibiotic use and all of the ways that we eat. Lack of fiber in our lack diet. Of fiber in our use diet. Use of antibiotics and meat. Yeah. yeah. Not it being exposed to the outdoors. Oh. That's a huge part of it. Um, and, wow. you know, so. Mm. Mm. When Chris and I were in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, there was a family from Brooklyn and the father called the kids kids come here, come here look that's a squirrel and they were they were amazed to see a squirrel uh i was <laughs> yeah. going what part of new york did they live in where a yeah. squirrel is an exotic species yeah one of the interesting things lately is i've seen a lot of people talking about the disappearance of bugs and mm. how um uh, they're just noticing fewer and fewer insects 
-hmm. And there's been a lot of discussion around that of, well, are we losing insects? Did we just now notice? When did they go away? Uh, All of these fascinating things. But it makes me think like, yeah, I guess maybe you hear fewer insect noises. Their their metric was bugs on the windshield driving at night. It's true. Uh, It's a good metric, actually. Yeah. (laughs) Really? Yeah, but it's just fascinating to think that there may be all of these creatures dying that we didn't even notice until Mm -hmm. they're already gone. Right. Right. Crystal's part of that. When she sees a bug in the house, they are gone. (laughs) So that she may be a factor but in that. Whenever I find a ladybug, though, I take it outside okay. because they're not scary. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you know we've seen declines in birds um, yeah. over the over my lifetime. Um, we're seeing amphibians. So when I was in college, my senior year in college, I went on a foreign study to Costa Rica and Ecuador. And I remember when we were headed to Costa Rica, my professor said, oh, we're going to go find the golden toad. If they oh. still exist, we're going to find them. Of course, yeah. this was just his dream to find the golden toad. And um, we didn't know it at the time, but they were already extinct. And um, oh. so they've not been, they've not been seen since um, the mid-80s um, or maybe, may, mm. maybe late 80s. Um, and so, and now, mm. yeah, the, we were hearing more about the loss of certain types of insects, um, but they're being replaced by maybe more pest insects. And that's the other thing is, so even though we might see a lot of bugs, are they the diverse assemblage of species that we should be seeing? Mm, And that's, um, so we're in this mass extinction. We're losing species faster than we can identify them. And I wonder what our responsibility as stewards of creation is in addressing this. I mean, we were given the job to care for the garden. Right, right. So one of the things you talk about in the book is the um, the way in which Christians are the most likely people to deny climate science, to be skeptics, and to, as you talked about, you know, not want to have anything to do with the environment. I mean, we don't even want to use the word environmentalism. Right. We use creation care because that's like not as scary. Uh, why do you think that is? And 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 what is it about? Uh, what power? What what could we do if more Christians? were exposed to wonder and developed a land ethic and, you know, decided to become stewards of creation. I've spent my whole career trying to understand why. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because this is who I am. This is how I was made. And I don't understand why people that love the same God that I love, this love the same creator that I love, don't feel the same way about his creation. In fact, it's really important because I had good friends in grad school who were not believers and they would say, well, I'll never be a Christian. Why would I want to be a Christian? You Mm. guys don't even care about the world we live in. Mm. And I think that's a very, yeah, it's a really important um, alert, right? I mean, we're we're supposed to evangelize the world and instead we're pushing people away from Christ. So many people, many Christians believe that it's not that care, caring about, nature, caring about the environment, caring about creation, I'll use all three ways that we could say that, (laughs) um, is separate from the gospel, but I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's a very hard thing to encourage people to consider. Yeah. Um, they see us as separate from creation, set apart from creation with a unique, um, responsibility. And I'm not denying that we are special in creation, but we are still created. Mm-hmm. and part yeah. of creation. And until we recognize that we are part of this creation and created to enjoy creation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, God enjoys it. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think that we're going to, I, I, there are lots of reasons why people are against environmentalism and most of them don't have anything to do with their Christian faith. They have more to do with, with politics. politics. Yeah. But, um, but I feel like, a big first step would be for people to recognize we are created. Yes, we have a special role, but we are created and we were created. And part of that reason is to enjoy creation Mm -hmm. and to be in relationship with God in his creation Mm -hmm. that he enjoys and loves. Mm -hmm. And if we care about other human beings, we need to be aware that by destroying our environment, there are health consequences. So we are, it's actually like, um, <clears throat> in a way, going up to someone in the grocery store and saying, oh, 
I'm going to expose you to COVID, <laughs> you know, and then <laughs> breathe on them. And it's just um, there. You And you mention in this chapter that there are both positive and negative results. There are health, well, especially the health benefits of nature. And I'm reading more and more about that, that being out in nature is helpful psychologically as well as spiritually as well as just our for our physiology Mm -hmm. and the studies are reinforcing that so if we're getting rid of nature it's like saying I don't care if other people die because I just want this to perpetuate the orthodoxy of more And I was surprised, too, where you talk about both light pollution and noise pollution having negative health consequences. Why is that? Well, light pollution, most people haven't seen the stars the way that Mm. they could if they weren't living in a place with a lot of light pollution. There have been studies that have shown that light pollution is significantly related to incidences of certain types of breast cancer. And it's because light pollution impacts the circadian rhythm and circadian rhythm is so important for hormonal balance. And so that's how it's tied to breast cancer. Um, That was something that I read in preparing to write this book that really surprised me. But the sound part has really, um, is Mm. kind of the surprise of this whole project that now I'm doing research on sound Mm. and how Mm. it's impacting people's health. And so just in my beginning attempts to create or to collect soundscape recordings. Um, I've been experimenting on myself. That's allowed. So I take, oh. <laughs> I take my, I take my heart rate, like before I set up my microphones, set up my microphones and turn them on. And I record for 20 minutes and then I take my heart rate at the end and it, my heart rate will drop 10, wow. 15 mm. beats per minute. Um, just while I'm sitting now, of course I've been recording in more, natural um, types of landscapes so far. I will be recording in cities and other places Mm. as well. Mm. And then I hope that um, I can do some experiments where people listen to different types of soundscapes and we measure their physiological responses. Mm. There's a lot of evidence that um, what you see and what you hear, maybe what you smell, but that's harder to replicate, right? We can't collect that. Um, (laughs) And, um, and the light that you experience can help you or hinder your recovery from medical procedures or um, just benefit your overall health. Mm. Look at the people that live, the really, really, really old aged people. I wonder, I don't know for sure, but whenever they show them on the news or something, I feel like they're kind of in a rural part of the world. Yeah. Like they're in a, a more farm like somewhere. In a, yeah. They're in a, in a place where they're separate from the stress of noise, constant noise. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another element of this book that has been arranged through a grant by one of the Wade Center uh, board members is to have Wheaton faculty to respond to each of Kristen's lectures that become these essays. And the one that really interested me, and this may be a good way to end, is Emily McGowan, who in her response quoted St. Thomas Aquinas. And what I loved about that is we're not just going back to C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and of course their interest in the romantic poets like Wordsworth and Coleridge, and Wordsworth, of course, famously talked about splendor in the grass, glory in the flower, you know, and that was back in 1798. Um, But now here, Aquinas in the 12th century, is he 12th, 13th century, he talks about the importance of wonder. Mm -hmm. And so this has been part of Christian tradition. And for him, developing wonder is part of a virtuous habit that we need to access and there's something that Emily, um, Dr. Emily McGowan called, uh, she didn't call it, an uh, ancient tradition called Visio Divina, praying with the eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what we all need to be doing more of is praying with the eyes. This isn't just some newfangled environmentalist um, deal that some people discount because 
their their politics are more important to them than their Christianity. This is a long time tradition of the faith, and we need to remember that. I want to tell all listeners that we will give you a special 25% discount oh, wow. on Dr. Page's book, The Wonders of Creation, and with her autograph in it. So all you need to do is email wade at wheaton.edu and tell us, I heard on the podcast, I could get a copy of this stunning book for 25% off. So just mention the Wade podcast. Thank you, Kristen, so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, good conversation. The Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to the Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.